No doubt you are familiar with William Hogarth's 18th century print, Gin Lane, which satirizes the perceived evils of gin drinking. By the 1700s, gin had come to rival beer in popularity. The state had encouraged gin production. Regulation was poor, and there were backstreet distilleries everywhere. It was widely available and a cheap alternative to beer. Hogarth depicted the resulting gin craze of Great Britain, and particularly London, in support of the Gin Act of 1751, which sought to reduce consumption through taxes and stricter retail licensing. Political and religious leaders thought gin resulted in all sorts of vice, debauchery, and criminal behaviour. In 1736, the Middlesex magistrates complained, It is with the deepest concern your committee observe the strong inclination of the inferior sort of people to these destructive liquors, and how surprisingly this infection has spread within these few years. It is scarce possible for persons in low life to go anywhere or to be anywhere without being drawn in to taste and, by degrees, to like and approve of this pernicious liquor. New restrictions were passed to stamp some control. Subsequently, beer increased in popularity with the working classes, but the craving for gin never really went away. There were even riots against the new laws and, eventually, rules were relaxed. Gin made its comeback in the early 19th century and the palaces appeared off the back of new licenses and private investment. These were gaudy and ornate drinking establishments in comparison to the dreary beer houses, highly decorated with columns, chandeliers and gaslights. Charles Dickens described them as perfectly dazzling. A flashy show of respectability that was no more than a veneer for rough clientele and a rowdy atmosphere. They were hugely popular and attracted the rich and poor alike to drink spirits. But the well-to-do were screened from the riffraff, who came in separately for their dram, before quickly moving on to the next magnet of temptation. But with numerous stories of pernicious evils of drink, like the ones you will hear today, and the rise of the temperance movement later in the century, the heyday of the gin palace was numbered. You can still find old gin palaces in London. Perhaps you've even been to one yourself. But what would you make of a visit to one of the palaces described in this video, and, moreover, some of the less salubrious characters you could have met? I would be interested to read your views in the comment section. In this video, we take a journey through the Victorian era to familiar ourselves with gin palaces, their clientele and attitudes to drink, with three different commentators from the beginning to the end of the period. Suffice to say that our reporters wax lyrical on the ruin of gin and drink in general, but behind these are the bleak stories of the people who drank in these bright and colourful drinking dens. Before we move on, Please consider clicking the subscribe button for more content like this. If you find this video interesting, I would really appreciate it if you could give it a thumbs up and share it widely with friends and family. You can also support the channel and get access to exclusive perks by becoming a channel member. Check out the Join button and description for more. London, 1837. An account by Walter Besant a novelist and historian whose works included accounts of the hard lives of the poor. As for the drinking of spirits, it was certainly much more common in 1837 than now. 1888. Among the lower classes, gin was the favourite, the drink of the women as much as of the men. Do you know why they call it Blue Ruin? Some time ago, I saw, going into a public house, somewhere near the West India docks, a tall, lean man, apparently five and forty or thereabouts. He was in rags. His knees bent as he walked. His hands trembled. His eyes were eager. And, wonderful to relate, the face was perfectly blue. Not indigo blue, or azure blue, but of a ghostly, ghastly, corpse-like kind of blue, which made one shudder. Said my companion to me, That is Jen. We opened the door of the public house and looked in. He stood at the bar with a full glass in his hand. Then his eyes brightened. He gasped, straightened himself and tossed it down his throat. Then he came out and he sighed as one who has just had a glimpse of some earthly paradise. 
Then he walked away with swift and resolute step, as if purposed to achieve something mighty. Only a few yards farther along the road, but across the way, there stood another public house. The man walked straight to the door, entered, and took another glass, again with a quick grasp of anticipation, and again with that sigh, as of a hurried peep through the gates barred with a sword of fire. This man was a, a curious object of study. He went into twelve more public houses, each time with greater determination on his lips and greater eagerness in his eyes. The last glass, I suppose, opened these gates for him and suffered him to enter, for his lips suddenly lost their resolution, his eyes lost their luster, he became limp, his arms fell heavily. He was drunk, and his face was bluer than ever. This was the kind of sight which Hogarth could see every day when he painted Gin Lane. It was in the time when drinking shops had placards stuck outside, to the effect that for a penny one might get drunk, and blind drunk for twopence. But an example of a blue ruin, actually walking in the flesh, in these days one certainly does not expect to see. London, 1848, an account by Thomas Miller, a prolific poet and writer. There are few places in London where so great a variety of characters may be seen popping in and out in a short space of time, as at the bars of our gin palaces. Even respectable men who meet each other by chance, after a long absence, must drop in at the nearest tavern, although they have scarcely a minute to spare, to drink a glass together at the bar and inquire about old friends, married women, we are sorry to say, many of them the wives of clever mechanics, also congregate here, generally in the morning when they go to market, and at a time when they ought to be providing the dinner for their families. Such things are thought but little of among those who are far from being numbered with the lowest orders of society. Then there are your itinerant vendors of almost every imaginable thing. These are also constant members of the bar, confining themselves generally to pennyworths of gin. The costermongers, who come wheeling and shouting from opposite directions with their barrows, if they chance to meet near the door of a tavern, must, after a little gossip, go in and have their drain. Added to these, there are the poor, the old, and the miserable, who look and feel half-dead, as they themselves express it, unless they are lighted up every two or three hours with a glass of spirits. Many of these have become so habituated to drink that they care but little for food, and very rarely partake of a substantial meal, a pennyworth of boiled shellfish, such as whelks or mussels, an oyster or two, or a trotter, and sometimes a fried fish, all of which are borne into these places by hawkers every hour of the day may be taken as fair samples of the food consumed by these regular drinkers. Nor is it at the front of the gaudily fitted-up bars alone where such quantities of spirits are consumed. Women and children even are coming in with bottles, some of the latter so little that they are scarcely able to reach up and place the bottle upon the zinc-covered bar. If the weather is cold, they are generally sent out in their mother's shawls and bonnets, the one trailing upon the ground and the other completely burying their dirty little faces. Ha! <laughs> Even these miserable young creatures are fond of drink, and may sometimes be seen slyly drawing the cork outside the door, and lifting the poisonous potion to their white withered lips. They have already found that gin numbs and destroys, for a time, the gnawing pangs of hunger and they can drink the fiery mixture in its raw state. Poverty and misery, and a want of the proper necessaries of life, have driven and are still driving hundreds to drink in this vast metropolis. Better food, better wages, and more employment are the only remedies that can be applied to this crying evil. They would sooner disperse a mob than all the police force with their staves. But your downright, thorough dram-drinker is a strongly marked character. When you have once seen him, you are sure to recognize him again, for he belongs to a class which you are able to identify at a glance. 
He is generally well known in the places he haunts. He comes in almost noiselessly, invariably rubbing his hands and shrugging up his shoulders as if very cold. If known, he seldom speaks. A nod on both sides is sufficient, and the accustomed glass is handed to him in silence. But watch the intensity of his countenance while the glass is filling. There is a grim, desperate smile all over it, as if he knew that it was slowly killing him, and loved the cause better than the effect. Observe how his hand trembles as he raises it towards his lips. With what silent delight he gulps down the fierce liquor, his eyes apparently closed, so intently are they riveted upon the glass, watching the last drop as it slowly trickles down the upturned vessel, and gives a long-drawn, ah, an indefinite kind of interjection, expressing something like pleasure, or regret, or it may be pain. He is generally alone, and seldom exchanges a word with anyone. Sometimes you are inclined to think that he is a man who has seen better days, who has sat at good men's feasts, who has held some respectable situation. Then charity whispers in your ear that he has met with many troubles, lost, or buried all who were once dear to him, that ever the same Lethe he still drinks. For his heart aches, and a drowsy numbness pains his sense and he strives in vain to steep his memory in forgetfulness, or it may be that drink itself was the first cause of all his sorrows. That he began timidly, selecting the most out-of-the-way places at the commencement, and looking cautiously around before he ventured in, and that this stealthy habit of taking his glass still remains unchanged. But few know where he lives, what he does, or in what hidden haunt his time is past. Sometimes you fancy that you have seen him in the daytime, in the darkest and remotest box of a low coffee-house, as if asleep, with his head resting upon the table, and his face buried in his hands. At others, in a tap-room, but this is in the very last stage of his decay, where he has become a kind of hanger-on, something less respectable than the pot-boy, and here he is at everybody's beck and bid, and ready to do anything for this destructive drink. Or he may know a few old friends whom he visits by stealth, and from whom he occasionally obtains a shilling, only expressing their wonder that he is not yet dead. Perhaps one of these is kind enough to pay for his lodging, a truckle bed in some dirty attic, where the only misery he finds is retiring to it sober. Even the very cabmen know and pity him, calling him by some peculiar name of their own, and frequently they invite him to drink. For years he wears the same old suit of clothes as one garment drops off, another but little better is given to him by some old acquaintance whom in former days he used to meet in a quiet old-fashioned parlour. When he dies, if buried at all, it is at the expense of the parish. If no one owns him, his remains are often in the night born to some hospital. London, 1884, an account by John Goff, an active speaker for the temperance movement. Oh, the noise of Butcher's Row, Whitechapel, especially on a Saturday night, yelling, screeching, howling, swearing, fighting, laughing. It's a combination of commerce, fun, frolic, cheating, begging, thieving, Devilry, short pipes, thick sticks, mouldy umbrellas, dirty faces, and ragged coats. Here are gin palaces in profusion. The company such as you see nowhere else. In some of them, it is hardly safe to venture without a policeman. Very few barmaids. Men, strong, stout fighting men, dispense the liquor. Let us look at a modern gin palace or public house in London. There are some which are regarded more respectable than others, but this corner establishment is an average palace. It's very bright, 
gaudy and glittering, its brilliant gas jets gleaming through its windows of finest plate glass. There is no lack of French polish and gilding. Tier after tier of gigantic casks surround the room. Beer is sold an half penny a pint cheaper than at the beer house. It is curious beer, half sweet and half acrid, black, muddy, brown in the froth, unpleasant to the taste, adulterated, cobbled up, that the dealer may get rich and the customer drunk and poisoned. There is very little beer that is not doctored and made even worse than its original state by deleterious drugs. Indeed, every kind of intoxicating liquors is adulterated. The manufacture of wines, brandies, whiskies, and other liquors is a wonderfully profitable trade, and their production is a startling revelation. The Gin Palace has not only a bar, but divers' boxes partitioned off from the general area. The area before the bar will hold 70 or 80 persons, allowing at the same time room for a stand-up fight. There is the wholesale bar entrance, retail entrance, jug and bottle entrance. But wholesale or retail, jug or bottle, it means beer and spirits. The bar is covered with pewter perforated to allow the drainages, washings and out spillings of the glasses to run through, all of which is dealt out again under the name of all sorts. The drinkers being shaky in the end, the profit from this source tells up at the close of the year. At the back of the bar are placards printed in colours and framed, telling of Old Tom, Cream of the Valley, Superior Cream Gin, Beer, Strong as Brandy, Tenpence a pot, the Jew off Benevis, Kinahan's LL, the right sort. I was told, when in Dublin, that the origin of the mark on the casks of Kinahan's LL is that one of the Lord Lieutenants, some years ago, was very partial to a certain kind of whiskey made by Kinahan, and when the casks were sent to the government house, they were marked Kinahan's LL, the right sort. Look at the landlord, corpulent. Hands in his pocket, his keen eyes fixed on the beer or gin-drawing gymnastics of his barman, who wears a cap and holds a piece of straw or the stalk of a flower in his mouth. See how viciously he bites the silver coin when suspicious of its genuineness. When he gives you change, he slaps it down on the counter with, "Here you are, and to the next customer, Now then! <laughs> there is generally a barmaid or two, and the number is increasing, for they are found more attractive than men with a brilliant complexion, long ringlets and a necklace. Look at the customers, for what you see in one gin palace is seen in all, with some qualifications. There is a sickening sameness, for while some of them have a respectable appearance, a majority of the frequenters are thieves, beggars, hoary-headed old men, stunted, ragged, rickety children, blowsy, slatternly women, heavy-looking labouring men, gaunt, sickly, Half-grown creatures. It is the same everywhere. The same woman giving her baby gin. The same haggard, dishevelled wife coaxing her husband home. The same poor girl sitting meekly in a corner with both eyes blackened while her partner is drinking. The same pale, weary-looking little man who appears as if he had come up out of his grave to get another glass of gin and has forgotten his way back. <laughs> the same red-nosed man who disgusts you with his slang and surprises you with his Greek and Latin quotations. The same thin spectral man who has no money, with hands piteously laid over each other, standing for hours, gazing with gin-hungry eyes at the liquor, licking his fever white lips, smelling, thinking, hopelessly longing, more dreadful than any. That same miserable girl, sixteen in years, one hundred in misery, with foul matted air, ragged boots, cracked voice, tattered shawl, an hopeless eye, or haggard face stamped with the impress of death. See that man whitening his face to do the ghost in Hamlet? <laughs> Here's a costermonger, with a basket, pressing his way up to the bar, and jostles that vendor of fish. Now then, stupor, where are you driving to, eh? Oh, say, I'm blessed if there isn't the very same fish you was a-vending a week ago last Monday. <laughs> Come, old fellow, I'll butter your muffins both sides for you and throw in the pepper for nothing. Will you? 
Oh, I can, and I will, both set down their baskets. The slang is awful. One of the raggedest, dirtiest, and smallest of the boys climbs on a barrel and shouts out, Fair play! An extensive shindy is kicked up, and the fighting becomes, as one of them tells us, quite promiscuous. The police are called in. The house cleared, the doors closed, the mob dispersed, the door opens, and the game goes on. Such is a fair specimen of a certain class, and by far the most numerous class of publics. In proof that my description is not overdrawn, I'll give an extract from the leading newspaper of England. For a scene of horrid vice and filth and lust and fury, all drawn into one point and there fermenting, a man might search the world all over and not find a rival to a thriving public house in a low gin-drinking neighbourhood. Is it, then, astonishing that of such scenes as these an eminent judge should say that the working man often enters a public house respectable and leaves it a felon? While the Londoners have imitated the Americans in some beneficial respects, they have imitated them in a ruinous direction in the cafes and saloons that are springing up in the best thoroughfares, many of them very gorgeous and attractive, most of them with private apartments, the customers of an higher grade in the social scale than those to be found in the common but less dangerous gin palace. I have stood as a looker-on before some of these places to note their patrons. They come in cabs or handsomes, young girls with their gentlemen friends, perhaps lovers, nothing there to offend the eye, a policeman on special duty, no noise, no profanity, no ribald songs. It is genteel. Such places are byways to perdition. Then there are the music halls, many of them disgraceful, some more exclusive, others tolerably decent, all licensed by Act of Parliament. There is no trade so damaging to the community, so dangerous to the people, and so hardening to the dealer as the trade in intoxicating liquors. Men, naturally kind-hearted, who would help a fellow being in distress, risking their own lives to save other lives, seem in this trade to lose all humanity or sympathy with a race, as far as their trade is concerned.